Okay. I'll uh, call to order the meeting of the Audit and Compliance Committee uh, here this morning. Uh, good morning to all of you. I uh, hope you blew in carefully and safely this morning. Uh, we were, didn't quite get the wind that was projected last night or said we would get, but it's uh, good to see you all here. Uh, I have the gavel today um, at the designation of Chair Powell. Uh, the chairs, uh, the committee chair, uh, Rep. Regent Kenyana, is unable to attend and its vice chair, uh, Regent Rocha, is participating remotely. Uh, so with that, I have the gavel, and uh, I think we will be joined, joined around the horseshoe today with only one other regent, Regent Davenport. There's only two of us here, and uh, Mary, you see how quickly it is easy to move to the middle to the <laughs> chairmanship. <laughs> you, you move fairly quickly at, at times. Uh, I'd also like to uh, welcome, uh, I think, remotely uh, two student representatives, uh, Mary McDougall from Crookston and Riley Tuft from the Duluth campus. Uh, thank you for joining us. So with that, uh, let's turn to our agenda. I think the agenda today will be fairly uh, uh, straightforward, very quick. I think we only have three items on the agenda, but unusual, uh, for a audit and compliance committee, uh, we will be having a second committee meeting later this afternoon or after right after lunch um, to uh, take up a very, very important topic. Uh, so let's turn to our agenda. The first item is the external auditor report. Uh, uh, Regents, you should have received uh, probably two months ago, uh, the 1st of November, end of October, uh, this report for your, uh, for your uh, chance to look through it and look over it. Uh, the external report uh, of the external auditor uh, will be brought to us uh, today. Uh, joining us will be controller uh, Sue Paulson and Katie Knudsen and Judy Dockendorf with Deloitte and Tooch. Um, if you remember when we looked through the report a couple of months ago, it was really a, a very, very standard report. Uh, we received it. It was very clean. Uh, my perception was very, very clean. And there seem to be no material deficiencies uh, uh, in the report. Uh, so with that, I will turn, I don't know who will be going first, uh, Sue? Sue. Okay, we'll turn to you. Thank you, Regent Spigum. Um, I'm here as the controller of the university and I'm sitting here next to our, our external auditors from Deloitte. They're gonna provide a summary as you stated of the audit of the financial services and also um, provide a summary of some other work that they're doing for the University of Minnesota. So I'll turn it directly over to them. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Katie or Judy, I don't know who wants to go first, but... I'll, I'll start, Regent Spigum. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, as you mentioned, we issued the financial statements for the University of Minnesota at the end of October. Those financial statements include an unmodified or a clean opinion, so the highest level of an opinion we can give, and there were no material findings, as you noted, in the financial statements. Our audit work actually began last spring, or this spring, excuse me, of 2021. So we started in the April-May timeframe in meeting with the university, working through understanding current year transactions, understanding internal controls in place around both IT systems, access controls, segregation of duties, um, and also business process controls. We then risk assessed and plan our procedures to test the financial statements. That happens subsequent to year end. So we come back in the August and September timeframe to test the financial statements. We do analytical tests, tests of details, and review the disclosures in the financial statements themselves. That culminates in the October 29th issuance of the financial statements, which did have an unmodified opinion. A few highlights related to the financial statements. The significant accounting policies are disclosed in note one, which is rather lengthy if you're reading through the financial statements. Outside of the adoption of GASB 84, which relates to fiduciary activities, there were no significant changes in the accounting policies followed by the university. The adoption of GASB 84 did result in changes to previously issued um, balances related to 2020, as well as the addition of two new statements, a statement of fiduciary activities financial position 
and a statement of fiduciary activities, statement of activities, so kind of the income statement there. There was a lot of work done by the university to understand the impacts of GASB 84 and the related disclosures. So a lot of work by Controller Paulson and her team on that new standard. Accounting estimates are also an area we spend time and we have a slide here follow up where we'll talk about a few accounting estimates and key risks that we focus on during the audit. And there were no uncorrected misstatements in the financial statements for 2021. A key risk and a significant risk for all audits, so not specific to the University of Minnesota, but something that's a focus area as a result of our audit standards is management override of controls. To address this risk, we look at internal controls around account reconciliations, journal entries, reviews of the financial statements. We actually are able to get a population of all journal entries recorded, and we do testing on that to ensure there was no management override or bias identified in those journal entries. We also look at any key judgments or estimates to make sure there's no bias. We hold fraud discussions across the university and with members of the Board of Regents as well as President Gable. And we also perform analytical procedures on the financial statements themselves to identify whether or not there are any unusual trends we may want to further look into. There were no issues noted as a result of our procedures performed over management override. Additionally, from an estimate perspective, we look at the valuation of alternative investments. The total investments of the university are about $3 billion. So just about half of the total assets as of 2021. Within that, the alternative investments are those valued at net asset values, hard to value investments is about $1.9 billion. So a significant balance that we spend time starting in June and really spend a significant amount of time in August and September working with the Office of Investment Banking to understand investments held by the university. We send confirmations to external parties. We do independent <clears throat> valuation testing, look at recent purchases and sales, and look at benchmarking. There were no issues noted as a result of our procedures. I won't spend much time here, just some other required communications. Um, we had great cooperation throughout our audit procedures. Again, in 21, we did perform our procedures remotely, but we had great access via Zoom and calls with Controller Paulson and her team. And then to the extent we did need to be physically on site for a few of our testing areas, we were able to do that. Related to the other services we provide, so our, my previous communications really focused on the financial statement audit of the university. We also perform various compliance and agreed upon procedures for the university. And I'll walk through them separately here. The first two items here, the federal compliance audit, as well as the Minnesota Office of Higher Education examination relate to compliance work that is done. On the federal audit, this is done every year. The university in 2021 expended over $1 billion in federal awards. Significant amounts here include the amounts expended for research and development, as well as student financial assistance. The university does qualify as a low risk auditee and this year's scope will include the testing of five major programs. We're in process with this work, and when we come back in February, we'll report on the issuance of that report. Similarly, we test the exam, we do an examination related to state financial aid that student, students get. So we make a number of selections at each of the campuses, and we'll issue reports for each campus here in January related to the examination procedures. Each of these procedures are performed on an annual basis for the university. And then agreed upon procedures that we perform, the first two relate to the NCAA guidelines. So the NCAA publishes requirements for these procedures to be performed for both division one and division two institutions. The Twin Cities campus, this work is performed each year. It's required annually. 
Whereas for Duluth and the Crookston campuses, it's every three years. So for 2021 this year, Duluth is in scope and Crookston will come back in scope in another two years. The procedures we perform here are outlined by the NCAA and are consistent across all institutions that are governed by the NCAA. These reports are due in January, so we'll report back to you the results of our procedures in February. And then the last item happens occasionally as there are um, investigational drugs that be, are submitted to the Food and Drug Administration for approval. The FDA has a requirement that certain costs that are being submitted, um, we actually have procedures that are required to be performed over those. So we did that this fall with a report that was issued in September and there were no findings noted related to that. Uh, that's the end of our prepared remarks. Overall, we certainly appreciate uh, all the help throughout the year. We started back in February with the engagement letter and audit plan and we're able to wrap up the audit here in October and are happy to present to you today. And we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have related to this year's audit work. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I guess from our 3000 foot level or 30,000 foot level, the five words we like to hear are very clean. <laughs> Unmodified uh, opinion, yes. And, <laughs> and no material deficiencies. That's <laughs> yes. the, the five words we like to hear. Yes. And you get a little bit deeper into the uh, specifics, but that's good. And uh, if, if you would, and I, I think uh, we have Regent Rocha on Zoom, is that correct? Yep. Is there any other Regent on Zoom? It's just Regent Rocha. Uh, and Regent Tally Robbie. Oh, Re Re Regent Tally Robbie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Bo, you're out there someplace too. So if you have a question, either Regent Rocha or Regent Tally Robbie, uh, just uh, signal us and we will get to. Yes, Okay, but anyway, thank thank you for your presentation, and yep. uh, we'll turn to uh, members. Uh, uh, Regent Davenport has a question. Thank you, Acting Chair Swigum, and thank you for the presentation. And I um, don't have a question, but I would like to thank the entire university community for their diligence with compliance of these standards. It's really remarkable for an institution and system this size and so broad to have such uh, a great outcome in this audit. So I think um, it's, it, it merits recognition of the whole community. Thank you. And, and I am also aware that we've been joined on Zoom by Regent Verhalen too. Um, Cody is out there someplace uh, in the Zoom world. Uh, questions, uh, any uh, Regents have any further questions of, uh, of uh, either uh, Jody or Katie? Judy or Katie, excuse me. Oh. If not, uh, thank you. Uh, do you maybe, maybe I'll go back. You said there are three ongoing audits right now? There you mentioned are the four. 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 So the federal compliance audit, the state examination for the financial aid students get from the state of Minnesota. The higher education. Yep. And then two agreed upon procedures for the NCAA, one for Twin Cities, one for Duluth. Duluth. Okay. So four. And that will be February, is that what you mentioned? Correct, we are planning for issuance of those in January, so we'll report back in the February meeting the results of those audits for you. Okay, thank you, we see the path. Any further questions of any of the regents on Zoom or the student regents? If not, uh, thank you very, very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, second item on the agenda uh, addresses oversight of the university's compliance with a variety of laws and regulations that touch the university system. Uh, joining us will be Katherine Bonnison, who is the uh, Assistant VP for University Health and Safety. Um, I think this presentation will give us a little oversight of the compliance the laws and regulations uh, um, to give us a little bit more idea of uh, the space that we work in uh, and help us better understand those rules and regs laws that we, we have to comply with. So uh, thank you for joining us, Catherine. Thank you, Acting Chair Spigum. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Like I said, I'm Catherine Bonnison. I'm the Assistant Vice President for University Health and Safety. So we'll spend a, hopefully a brief amount of time just talking about some of the broad compliance laws, regulations that impact the university, um, and a lot of them that run through university health and safety. We're sort of a, 
I don't want to say junk drawer, but it feels like a junk drawer of a lot of departments that run sort of quietly behind the scenes that kind of manage a lot of the health, safety, environmental management functions of the university. So to begin sort of the overview of, you know, it's, it's not a long presentation. Hopefully there's some pieces out of here that um, you know, bring about some conversation or thought because it's something that probably you don't see every day, a lot of the work that goes on behind the scenes. So we're just going to talk a little bit about what is that work? What does that compliance look like at the university? Um, and why it's sometimes complicated because we are such a large, um, you know, land grant, many, many missions, many activities going on under one roof. We'll talk about future trends and compliance and then opportunities for us going forward to continue to do what we do and do a really, a really good job. So overall, university health and safety is comprised of six departments, um, and some of them seem as different as possible. So it's a very interesting job that I have to try to bring these folks together there. Um, we go everywhere from bio, bio safety and occupational health, environmental health and safety. Uh, this includes workplace safety, lab safety, environmental management, industrial hygiene, regulated waste. Regulated waste doesn't sound um, like something that was it's obvious. That's the folks that come in and pick up all the material from the labs that can't just be disposed of, right? So things that just can't go down the drain or go in the trash. Um, a building code department, similar to what you'd see in a municipality. And so those are the folks that issue permits and licenses. We have radiation safety. Radiation safety covers the entire university and the clinical enterprise as it relates to the, to the University of Minnesota. Um, the Office of Emergency Management. So those are the folks that do planning and preparedness. So we were on the phone last night talking about snow and ice and are we gonna get into work and what's gonna happen? Um, and then of course the Health Emergency Response Office who I know you've heard from quite a bit the last two years, the Director DeBoer, pandemic planning, um, health emergency response. Uh, responsibilities. So that's university health and safety. The one key piece with us is we are system wide. So we support all campuses, all research stations, and we have folks on every campus, which is a unique model for the university. So our mission is sometimes complicated. And I think this is one of the reasons um, previous Chief Auditor Klatt had wanted us to come speak is we serve many roles. And so it's at times we're a service partner and we're coming in to provide advice or to help clean up a spill or to help identify an issue. And so then we can turn around and the next day we're showing up as a regulator, right? And we're saying, hey, you gotta do this and this is why. And then the next day we might be showing up with the same department as a consultant, as a subject matter expert. And so we wear a variety of hats and sometimes our job is to influence and encourage safe behavior. And sometimes our job is to demand certain behaviors. And so it, it, it can change quite a bit. So our role in compliance, and, and this is just, an, oh, just a, a, a sampling of the laundry list. As you all know, there are many, many <laughs> agencies out there between the federal, state, local, county level um, that have regulations and rules that we have to follow. So just to give you a sense of sort of what, what sort of pieces affect the university. So regulatory compliance, we often manage licenses, permits, any programs that has a regulatory piece to it, environmental compliance, so air, ground, water. Um, we issue building sanitary permits. We run the federal select agent program, which really on the research side, that's how to manage really sort of dangerous things that we work on in the research laboratory. Um, we help manage OSHA and OSHA standards for workplace safety. Uh, we ran drug and alcohol testing for folks who would um, um, fall under that rule, who drive you know, big 18,000 pound plus vehicles. We manage all the hazardous waste licenses at the university, which there are over 50. We run the controlled substances program. So anyone using um, anything deemed a controlled substance by the DEA, we have oversight over. We help manage Clary Act exercises to make sure we're in compliance and many more. But I just want to give you a flavor of these are things you probably don't see or hear about every day, but that are going on on a regular basis at the university. So again, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. So in 2020, if you look at sort of by the numbers activity through university health and safety, we support all five campuses, the 10 rocks, 20 research stations, and any other activity that has sort of a university attachment to it. Um, we manage 52 hazardous waste licenses for the university system, seven air emission permits, 24 storm or wastewater permits. We either develop or manage 60 safety related training courses. We conduct more than 800 lab inspections throughout the year. 
We have conducted more than 200 air quality assessments, and those are the folks in industrial hygiene who might go out if someone says, I'm concerned about my air quality. One of our folks will go out and actually sample and come back with a report and recommendations. Um, we manage more than 3,450 occupational health records. And then we typically get inspected here at the university about once a week. And so it was interesting on my way out this morning, one of our directors said, got an inspection. We just had one yesterday. We've got another one coming in this next week. And so we, we stay pretty busy with inspections. So compliance at work, what it might look like at the university, again, just to help sort of put this in a more um, sort of storytelling way. So if you have a researcher or a clinician who says, you know, gosh, I want to do this research, but it involves a radiological material, state statute requires that they register that material with university health and safety. So that's, I mean, that's the compliance piece, right? And then once they register it, it's on to us to make sure that it's managed appropriately and disposed of, the biggest part disposed of appropriately. Um, if there's an event or a concert at Huntington Bank Statement, state, uh, Stadium, any temporary structure or any kind of power supply, anything that's new would go through building codes. And so our folks would show up to make sure that it's all permitted appropriately. Um, if a principal investigator wants to work with a new variant, let's say African swine fever, they would work with our biological folks to make sure they mitigate the risk appropriately. Um, if a department wants to use chemicals that are listed on Homeland Security's anti-terrorism list, then they have to register that chemical with us. And then we have to put in a whole monitoring plan. So these are, again, these are a lot of things that happen on, I'd say a fairly regular basis. And the good news with that is we have such a robust research program that these things, again, they happen regularly and we're the behind the scenes folks that help support that. And then if an employee that um, starts at the university is driving a DOT vehicle, we make sure they're drug and alcohol tested and any follow-up that's necessary. So again, just a slice of what it might look like at the university. So I think what Chief Auditor Klatt had wanted us to really talk about is sometimes why it's complicated. And when they get into audits and they look at, you know, why things, some things work really well and some things could work better. It's just to talk about why compliance can be complicated at a, a research university like ours. Some of that is because we, we function a distributed model, which has a lot of efficiencies, but sometimes the downside is that you lose that line of sight because some, a lot of the work and the activity happens within a college or a unit or happens within a campus that we just may not know or may not have a strong connection to activities that are going on. Um, navigating the regulatory changes, as we all know, things change on such a rapid basis that sometimes we don't know that a rule has changed until the next audit or inspection. And then you know, you're playing a little bit of catch up. Um, rapid changing research portfolio, which again is a great thing. It means that we're always innovative and cutting edge, but then the folks behind the scenes are trying to learn really quickly. What does this mean? What is the risk? What do we have to do to help mitigate it? And just the, the sheer size of our footprint, five campuses, again, 10 rocks, 20 research stations. We have a limited number of staff. And so we're just not everywhere all the time. And we try to figure out from a risk management standpoint, where, where's the, the best bang for our butt, buck? So kind of continuing on that theme, you know, again, sometimes at the university, we tend to have maybe um, unclear overlapping roles in our distributed model. And so we'll have folks within colleges or units who do similar roles to what folks in our unit might do. And, and that's a, you know, a peak opportunity, which I know Senior Vice President Franz and others will talk about. Um, sometimes if you lose staff turnover here is a, a major issue because these folks that we have in health and safety have done this job often for so long. They know the people, they know the safety partners, they know who to go to. So bringing on a new staff member can be a long ramp up for us a couple of years. And so that, that gets complicated and where things can sometimes be dropped. Um, silo departments, I, mean, they, I know it's a common theme, you hear it from many groups and we, we experience it some here, uh, but people tend to wanna do the right thing. Sometimes they just get so um, inward facing that they just fail to <clears throat> see the broader enterprise. And, and the other piece that it, it's gonna be talked about, I know later on in finance and operations is this um, risk tolerance and what's our, what's our tolerance, what's our appetite for risk at the university, how risk adverse should we be? And so how robust of a safety program is sometimes the question. You know, how many staff should we have at a certain place? And is this risk level acceptable or is it, should it be here? So I don't wanna focus on all the bad. There are things that really work well um, at the university. Um, there are challenges, but there are, also, there are also really good, really good components of the compliance program. We find that in general, people really wanna do the right thing. Very frequently when we try to address an, an issue, a regulatory issue, a compliance issue, 
a zero resistance. I mean, truly people just, they may not know, or, you know, maybe they, they've, it's not clear to them what the responsibilities are, but their intent is typically to do the right thing. Um, the system campus relationships that we have, I think works really well. Having embedded staff on each campus helps us um, do our job across the, the, entire, the entire system. Uh, deeper collaborations with groups like Office of Vice President Research and Facilities Management and Public Safety has really helped us do approach things in a hybrid way. And so not just having health and safety come, but having a team maybe address a problem. We have a really talented workforce. We're very lucky to have the folks that we have within health and safety, so that works really well. Um, recently, we were reorganized to report to the senior vice president's office, and that's been a, a really good thing for our, our group. It gives us higher visibility and also a cleaner um, line of sight, I think, with the rest of the university community. And I will also say the university has really well vetted, well managed research protocols, which really helps us do our job. So those are things that work really well. But as we always think of how can we do it better, some opportunities for improvement. Um, we could better prepare employees by improving the onboarding experience. And so as employees are hired to really understand what pieces of their job relate to safety and make sure we tag those folks, identify them to get the right training and, and knowledge and education. Um, back to the peak theme, try to encourage centralization of compliance functions versus distributing them out because it's really hard to manage. If everybody's in charge, sometimes no one's in charge. And then to con continue to promote a culture of safety through effective safety messaging, which has really ramped up this last six months and it's really made a difference. So we're appreciative of that. I think in, in kind of wrapping this up, when we think about future trends and challenges, you know, I don't see that regulators are going to step back from adding complexity. I feel like we're going to see more expectations around the regulatory requirements for, for the, the, the facets of the university that fall under those. Um, those areas. I think pandemic preparedness is with us and expectations from, uh, again, a regulatory and OSHA standpoint is that it will become an expectation that our workplaces function in a certain way um, in terms of safety of employees and staff and students. Um, we will continue to be innovative in our research at the university, which is fantastic. But then there's also this expectation that our staff is flexible, knowledgeable, quick to react and able to support that. Um, and I think just in, in general, employees and students expect more now. And I don't know if that's a pandemic related piece, but it feels like they just, they, they expect safety. They expect to know where they work is safe and that people care about them. <clears throat> so with that, I am open to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, VP uh, um, Bonnison. A um, couple of uh, comments from the chair first, and then I'll turn to Regent Davenport, who looks like she's itching. <laughs> ready to go. Uh, uh, the first is uh, if you would refer back to maybe uh, three um, pictures ago where you had the uh, silos. Yes. I know you were trying to uh, uh, portray the silo departments we have. Yes. Um, Farm Boy Galswick and I will clarify that those are not silos. <laughs> Those are grain bins. That is, you are fine. correct. And silos are different, okay? We, you are we, correct. We put the haylage and the corn silage and stuff in the silos. These are grain bins. So uh, <laughs> just, just a clarification from the farm, right, uh, Quinn? Yes. Okay. That is a very I, good catch here, Spigum. I, I, remember, well, I remember when I was looking through the docket and I saw those uh, the silo <laughs> departments. I'm thinking somebody in the Twin City area doesn't know what silos are and grain bins are. <laughs> It's not a big deal, you know. Uh, just a little, uh, little funny. Uh, second of all, um, and, and this is just a particular question for me. I, I'm overwhelmed with the rules and regulations and how you hold it all together. The space we have to regulate and report within, uh, you do a tremendous job. Uh, in a previous life, I used to run a, a oversee a department of uh, building codes and OSHA. And uh, in the OSHA department, we tried to bring forward a philosophy of uh, working with uh, unions and businesses and construction sites and stuff to, to work with them ahead of time before a problem would exist, uh, not just be a Gestapo coming in afterwards and, uh, and fining them, but working with them to make a real workplace safety uh, site. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, you are sometimes a service partner and sometimes a regulator. 
Um, I like the service partner, but you know there needs to be regulation. There needs to be a, a time when uh, you know people are called on the carpet for doing wrong. Tell me a little bit more about the uh, the service partner part of it. The uh, working with a department or a group sure. or organization to make sure our our sites are safe, as opposed to uh, just the regulation standpoint. Sure. Thank you, Acting Chair Stigum. That's a great question. We try very much to be influencers versus regulators if we can. And so we do have a, a, a framework of safety partners are assigned to each major department um, and, and college and unit or campus. And so those safety partners are proactively reaching out. They are working with folks to try to help them understand what is required. We don't, those safety partners don't come into a work site and with a, you know, I told you so sort of attitude. It's let me help you understand However, at some point, if we don't make progress, then it does circle back to these are the requirements. So the approach initially is always to educate, to inform, to be proactive and making sure people understand what's expected and to listen, because sometimes there are challenges in those, in those work sites where you really have to help them troubleshoot. Um, and so that's the initial approach. But in the end, if we can't make progress, then we will mm -hmm. escalate things. I like the perspective. VP Bonison, uh, as we look at OSHA, and uh, workplace safety. Would you have any idea what our workers' comp rate is? Uh, uh, do we have a, uh, a good history here on campus of, uh, of, of workers' comp injuries and reports? Uh, are we at the 1.0, we we below, we above? Uh, do you have any idea at all? It's a, it's a great question, uh, Mr. Swiggum. I'm, I'm trying to remember all the data and I wish I had my phone a friend. I know that we do a, a very good job. We have a lot, of, a lot more near misses than actual injuries. Um, it's been years, at least I've been in this position for three years, that we've had anything that's fatal or near fatal at the university. I would say on average, we're probably 15 to 20 reportable major injuries per year. I don't know how that compares to other universities, our size, but I would say in general, our workplace uh, injuries are probably very good, very low um, in comparison. And I wish I had all that data on the top of my head, but I know in asking um, it our- It gets a our, little specific. In yes, our I, safety I managers, there's never been a call for concern as in, wow, these numbers are really high or out of, you know, out of range. Very, very good. We got to keep our workplace safe. safe. It's, it's imperative for our employees. It's imperative for our, our people here that be a safe place. And we're on the same page. Sometime yes. or another, when you get our workers' comp rating, let me know what it is if you do get Will it. Will do. That will be a follow-up. Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Swiggum and AVP Bonison, uh, for that presentation. Um, I'm only somewhat familiar with the huge role you have. And I know that on smaller campuses, they may have one safety officer, or that officer might be shared among multiple uh, campuses. So um, I'm curious about uh, the number of employees you have and how that compares with this or fits into this distributed model. And then um, as we look at alignment and sharpening those line sites you spoke about, um, do you see that um, as we progress in peak initiative uh, that the impact may be that there's more time to focus on safety itself or to do the research that might be in these distributed areas and that that um, could um, increase safety and increase, say, efficiency productivity? AP Bonison. Yes, very good questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Regent Davenport. Right now, are her questions better than mine? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, she didn't she didn't call it the silo yeah. issue, so she's a little bit ahead there. <laughs> go on, go ahead, VP Bonson. Uh, so with the first part with the staffing model, um, currently University Health and Safety is staffed with about 72 employees uh, for full time. We have an FTE on the Crookston campus, the Morris campus, both those at 75%. The Duluth campus has three FTEs and the Rochester campus has 25% uh, FTE. So that's the way the staffing would look in that. But, the idea with the, let's say for Crookston or Morris, this, the person on those campuses can tie in to the larger team. And so they are a facilitator. So if there's a technical question, they're working with the broader health and safety team to help problem solve it. We, we certainly don't expect them to know everything and sort of, but they, they end up being a generalist that can help resolve issues. So again, we feel that it works pretty well. I don't know if the chancellors might, you know, have some other thoughts on that. 
Um, to, to the second question with the PEAK initiative, I do think there are real opportunities to improve the way that we prepare employees um, and make sure that especially around sort of, the, again, the onboarding, the, the employee training, the being clear about roles and responsibilities. I know some of the themes we hear with PEAK is that people have so many different responsibilities that it's really hard to be good at all of them. And so we really do want folks who know how to be a safety officer or you know, are, are aware of the, the regulatory responsibilities within their, their group. And again, I don't think anyone that maybe isn't keeping up is doing this out of neglect. I think it's just, it's hard to be good at everything. So I do think there are opportunities through, through PEAK. Great, thank you. Follow up at all, Ms. Nebuhr. Um, Provost Grossen. I just wanted to chime in and say that Catherine has been a really uh, integral part of the leadership team as we've navigated through this crisis. And I've been so impressed, not only with her, but especially with her team and the speed at which they were able to pivot and the amount in which their consultations really helped the university make wise decisions and implement those decisions. So kudos uh, to you and your group. As, as you mentioned, this is not a function that is often in the public spotlight, but you've done a really great job. Thank you, Provost Cresson. Those are very nice words from the Provost. <laughs> um, anybody on Zoom, any of our regents on Zoom have a question that would like to be asked of VP Bonison? Not that I'm aware of. If not, uh, thank you very, very much. Okay. Thank you, I really sure. appreciate the time. And we'll move on to the uh, third item on our agenda. Our final item is the committee's information items. Uh, Interim Chief Auditor uh, Coons and Chief Compliance Officer uh, Boyd Coomer will speak to these items. Wait for Boyd to get done. And then uh, Interim Chief Auditor Coons, uh, please proceed. Thank you. Um, your docket item summary on page 30, you'll find a list of engagements with external audit firms that are under $100,000. These require after the fact reporting to the audit and compliance committee. Then kind of working backwards, page 38 contains the controller semi-annual report. This outlines the priorities and the initiatives of the controller's office, as well as noting upcoming accounting and financial pronouncements and when they need to be implemented. Page 33 is the semi-annual chief compliance officer's report. It details the results of two compliance risk reviews his office completed and provides you with some statistics from the U-Report system, which is the university's confidential reporting hotline. And then page 32 is the annual institutional conflict of interest report. With permission of the chair, Chief Compliance Officer Boyd Coomer would like to briefly update you on a change that was made to this report. Okay, and uh, Boyd, thank you. Uh, Semi-annual means you come before us twice a year then, right? That is correct, <laughs> twice a year. So you, you receive you. the semi-annual report of the Chief Compliance Officer twice a year but the institutional uh, conflict of interest report comes in once a year okay. in, in December. And I just wanted to point out a Go couple ahead, changes if I may. Sure. Uh, so um, this report, which again, we, we share with you every year, um, uh, we've added a couple information items to this. So the second and third bullet point, the second bullet point, uh, where we conducted an annual review of our financial relationships uh, that we have with business entities that fall into TechCom, uh, gifts to the University of Minnesota Foundation, visitor contracts and sponsored research. We conduct this review every year and, and we have historically conducted this review every year. And the, the findings have always been that we uh, did not identify any relationships that compromise the university. However, we have not historically called that out in the report. We just were silent on it because there was nothing to report. Uh, it was internal audits recommendation and we felt it was a good one that even though uh, we on, a, on an annual basis had not yet found any, any issues that we should call that out in the report just to make you aware. So we're doing that with this report. And the third point, bullet point <clears throat> um, along those same lines, we did not identify any matters involving the following subject matter reserved to the Board of Regents for managing, reducing, or eliminating institutional conflict of interest. And then the, um, the items 
underneath that bullet point. Uh, we found nothing that fell into these categories. Again, we, we take a look at this every year. This is something that's always on our radar screen and the results always been negative. We just wanted to call that fact out. So uh, to make the report a little bit more clear. And then last, but certainly not least, I wanna bring your attention down to the very last paragraph of this report. And, and with uh, a very thankful heart, <laughs> uh, Make note that Honorable Dr. H. Brian Neal III, um, uh, physician, researcher at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, Regent Emeritus served 15 years on our Conflict of Interest Review Panel um, with wisdom and grace, just a, a fantastic individual. He helped us examine financial conflicts of interest um, his eye towards science and ethics uh, was incredibly valuable, and he helped us uh, arrive at ethical and practical solutions to these conflicts. The, and uh, he is stepping down after those 15 years, and we are so fortunate that Honorable Dr. Patricia Simmons, Regent Emeritus, is, is going to be our new community representative. So... Uh, we are very thankful. I just wanted to make note of that. Boyd, you're tapping the best that Mayo has to offer. I, I uh, believe we are. Yes, sir. Two very, very good persons, uh, doctors and regents, both of them. Yes. So, uh, thank you very, very much. Questions of uh, CC, CCO uh, Coomer? Uh, anybody on Zoom, any of the regents or the student representatives? Uh, if not, Boyd, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of our agenda today. Uh, but before we adjourn, I'd like to uh, note that this is interim Chief Auditor Kunz's last meeting in the role. On behalf of the committee, uh, we'd like to uh, thank you very much for your capable service, Kelly, for your steady hand over these past months. Uh, thank you for serving. And we uh, look forward uh, to welcoming uh, incoming Chief Auditor Goswick to our committee in February. I believe you start the 1st of January, yes. your position, and, and you'll be before us in, in February. Uh, with that, I'll remind everybody that the Mission Fulfillment uh, Committee will begin at 9.15 or about uh, 30 minutes, if my eyes look at the clock right. Uh, there'll be no further business before the committee. Uh, the committee will stand adjourned.